Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. Now, today unfortunately we have to talk a little bit about a rather depressing concept, a rather depressing label, um, uh, a rather depressing thing that I've termed to consider a certain dimension of experience that could so be relating to an aspect of depression um, or an aspect of a neurosis that's born from certain complexes. Now, I've termed this thing, uh, I don't know how I came up with the name, it, it just kind of came to me, and I've termed it the nihilism of normality. Now, I've got a, a little quote here from my dreams book. Um, the nihilism of normality is a phenomenon that is best described by a feeling of intense mundanity that is mixed with an atheistic depression centered around the psychological, societal and biological mundane disgust of existence. So of course from that quote we obviously understand that it's related to disgust and if you're not aware, which you may not be aware, uh, there is a facet of experience or of personality, let's say, uh, called disgust sensitivity. And that relates, of course, to how sensitive you are to things that could be termed disgusting, messy, chaotic. So you obviously have a stronger version to those certain things if you're high in disgust sensitivity compared with whether you're low in disgust sensitivity. Now, I've not done any test uh, as of yet on disgust sensitivity for myself. I don't know whether there's one out there. I've not actually checked. Um, there most likely is. There's probably some way of doing it in a self-report um, with a Likert scale of 1 to 7 or 1 to 5. It's just I've, I've not researched that particularly. Um, but I would probably say that I'm quite average in disgust sensitivity. I wouldn't necessarily say... Uh, of course, in certain experiences, you can feel as if you're high in disgust sensitivity. We all can. Um, but generally, on a whole, I wouldn't say I'm particularly high in disgust sensitivity for the, for the reason that I can be very, very messy and chaotic and I can let uh, mess build up. I can let um, plates sit in places and grow things on them if I, if that so happened to happen. Uh, if that so happened to happen, there we go, that's a phrase in itself, isn't it? Um, but if that happened, and I wouldn't necessarily be have a, uh, an aversion to something like that, um, the places where maybe I could argue that my disgust sensitivity is a bit more high is certain things like, um, well, what I've done is I've tried watching certain operations to get over certain complexes I have built around uh, medicine and things like that, or, or medical complexes. Uh, or, or um, hypochondria, health anxiety, and things like that. And I've tried watching videos uh, of operations, and I tend to have a bit more disgust sensitivity around that. But again, a lot of people have that. So, and of course, I have to be considerate of the certain things that I've had in my life that would then lead me to be naturally more, have naturally more of an aversion to those sort of stimulus. So, um, or stimuli. But, um, it's, I would say on the whole, I'm probably around average, not particularly high, not certainly not low. Um, so this kind of concept of analysis of normality does relate to discuss sensitivity, and it is a part of it, but it also bleeds into some sort of depression. Um, and let me give you an example of what I talk about with the nihilism of normality. So let me just... Uh, we read that quote for you. So, the nihilism of normality is a phenomenon best described by a feeling of intense mundanity that is mixed with an atheistic depression centered, centered around the psychological, societal, and biological mundane disgust of existence. So, it's very, very powerful and very sensitive feeling, very depressive uh feeling of these experiences in reality with which we feel an intense disdain of our human condition 
So let me give you an example. Um, let's say you've been drinking one night and the next morning you wake up and there is a ton of cans and clothing and this and that and food on the floor and sick on the floor so like really you've got in a total mess that only happens once in a blue moon but you have this kind of feeling within the feeling of the nihilism of normality of this aversion to that particular environment and an aversion to your body and an aversion to how weak your body is in that moment, how horrible your body is that it doesn't work for you, that it's ultimately going to fail on you, that you're going to go into voidness, into into nothingness after your death and you, you feel as if entropy takes a hold of you in a psychological setting uh, and you all of what it means to be depressed comes into view but in a very interesting way within the context of disgust sensitivity within the context of being disgusted by your very um, imperfect humanity that is the nihilism of normality the imperfect humanity and the disgust for it and the the aversion of your biological processes, your psychological processes, societal processes, um, you know, expectations, societal demands, societal um, ideas and ideology and uh, stereotypes and all these sorts of things present within this incredibly deep-seated feeling that comes in and comes out. And it's, you see, depression is a cloud over you. That's what depression is. It's a cloud that you can't see the end of. And you may just have about been able to see where it came from. But you, you're you almost in this cloud in which is covering you. And when you're walking down the street, you're not being able to see colour. You're looking at the, the grass or the trees and the birds and the bees and all this sort of stuff and they're not colourful, they're not there, they're not vivid, they're not blue like this shirt or red like this jacket, they're a dull colour, they're a, 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 a sucking out of colour out of the world, it's kind of like the third Harry Potter movie with the Dementors. Um, and when they come in, whenever you see a scene with the Dementors, it goes cold, it goes a little bit darker, the saturation's taken away a bit. That's uh, this feeling of depression with regards to the coloration being lost from reality. And it's an extended thing for days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks. And I mean, especially if it's a severe uh, case. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm talking about the coloration because... The coloration can come in and out, whereas the depression can be more sustained. But if it's like really bad depression, the coloration goes out for a very, very long time period as well. As well as just this feeling of voidness, of nothingness, of of uh, no enthusiasm, no appetite. No compulsion, no instinctual desire to do anything, to live life, to taste the, the beauty of existence. There's none of that. All that animation has gone. It's like a human is, 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 um, I don't know, is, is taken. Their spirit is taken. It's, it's, it's not a nice thing at all. But it's not like that, the nihilism of normality. The nihilism of normality is a feeling that's more fleeting, that's more in a moment, for a few moments, for a few minutes, and then passes. And the nihilism of normality is a feeling that is 
directly relating to idealism. So, the idealistic, the extremist idealistic individual feels the nihilism of normality because they've not accepted fully all the facets to reality and to what reality means and to what being human means. What being human fundamentally means is so expansive, so complex, so much more than we could ever think. But within that complexity lives two or three or four simpler things which are good, bad, happy, sad, these sorts of things in which we have experiences that are good and that are happy and that are rich. Uh, we have experiences that are sad, that are bad, that are mundane even, you know, in, be in between really the bad and the good, we have this mundane experience and we have experiences that are quite normal and quite average and then we have experiences that are euphoric and then we have experiences that are absolutely horrendous in grieving or in um uh in the loss of a, a, a an important relationship or a friendship um and and, it, and it's an idealistic it's tied to idealism because the person cannot accept this fact this very very fact that existence is this complex structure and complex spectrum of experiences that includes the nihilism of normality. But the more you exclude the nihilism of normality as a possibility of experience, and the more the individual tries to run away into fantasy or idealism and runs away from the real world and normal life that we're seeing a lot of at the moment, I certainly see it a lot of with regards to porn, pornography and things like that. If we're talking about um, uh, in the realm of sex, let's say, and the ide idealization of beauty and things like that. Um, but there's other ways, you know, that idealism comes in and that people just go down that route and, and don't actually absorb in a real extroverted exist objective uh, uh, existence in the real world um and they're more kind of introverted closed off and they close off the friendships and all this sort of stuff um and it's not a good thing at all um but it's related to that and it's when the individual starts to understand their idealism and understand this possession by ideas which can be either conscious to them or in a lot of cases, unconscious to them, because the possession by ideas, the way in which an idea possesses you, it's not something people think that, like, yeah, that possession by ideas is quite a conscious thing. I mean, you have an idea and then you go for it, and it's within your action, and it's all the rest of it. No, a possession by ideas is mainly unconscious and it's only when you start to learn about the Jungian concepts of the anima in the form of the idea, the anima being the idea, the captivation of the the, the anima in the idea, that you realise quite how unconscious the possession by ideas actually is. You see, the idea of um, an ideal standard of beauty and trying to attain that and trying to... Uh, capture that let's say for example uh if you're a man trying to realize that in some sort of pleasurable gratification in pornography that idea has captivated you that idea has in a very feminine manner possessed you and made you go towards that and made you and directs you towards that and it's uh a utilization of the instincts in the incorrect function. The correct function is going out there and having real world experiences. I don't care whether that's, personally, I don't care whether that's in casual sex or whether that's in a meaningful relationship or whatever. I'd like to think that it would be nice for you to get a meaningful relationship or do whatever, but I don't care whether whatever that experience is or 
whether it's, for example, that you're absorbing in things on the internet incredibly too much, aside from the whole, the whole pleasure and the sex and the beauty ideals. Maybe you're idealing something just generally on the internet and you're absorbing completely in that and not in the real world per se, uh, and you're, you're kind of half in the real world, let's say, and you're, you're in this other zone of, of this idealization of, 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 in the internet. And um, therefore, you know, you have to pull yourself away from that, pull you away from yourself away from that re- reinforced behavioral possession as well, because it comes into behaviorism. And move away from that and entertain the idea of uh, reality and all of the spectrum of reality, not just this idea of, oh, well, you know, we're going to... Um, we're going to take the good bits of reality because that's another unconscious possession by ideas. Or you say, well, okay, well, yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, well, I'll stop ego defending and I'll I'll get away from this and I'll I'll you know build up a certain life, extroverted life in, in the real world, and I'll commit myself to that a lot more and I'll understand my ideal idealism and, and things like that. But you end up pursuing things in more of their positives anyway and then that's just still the possession by ideas possession by certain um ideals rather than actually taking experience fully you see we see this a lot in the idea of simps you know the the idea of the new you know this new idea of the simp which is a word that is of course used far too often for my liking people call you a bloody simp these days if you just do one nice thing for one person of either the same sex or the opposite sex which you know ever you go for particularly um but it's totally overused um but we see it in the idea because what let's say the genuine person who is doing involved in simping is doing is that idolizing a fantasy an idea they're possessed by the idea of attaining this woman and they're being changed by the idea and what's happening is that the idea of realizing that ideal woman that is for the person in reality, which actually the, the woman isn't ideal, Every, no, no woman or no man is ideal, that's a total false, false statement, and we all know this, but certain individuals can get into this, certain individuals who are possessed by the ideas, or this ideal form, don't realise this, they have this idea that they're, they're fixated on this idea that that's perfection, that's the ideal and so they get possessed by the ideas of, of that relationship. And so they buy them presents. They think, oh, you know, I wonder, I think she'd like this. And then as soon as they get the thought, they're possessed by it. They have to go out and get things. It's like, okay, so I meet a, a, a you know, attractive girl, right? And we've all done this many times, you know, but let's say I meet an attractive girl and uh, she enraptures my, my instincts, you know, then, um, she says something that she likes something. Oh, you know. Oh, great! I got. I get that idea. Oh, I go and buy her something like this, right? You know. And if you're high in impulsivity as well, that's not going to help you. But um, you, oh, I go, I go and buy her something. Well, all you're being, all that's happening there is you're just being possessed by the anima in the form of of an idea. Um, and and and. So you're in this idealization still, you see. So it's about accepting reality with all these things in it. And the only way you get over the nihilism of normality, the this disgust, this uh, uh, unliking of the real negative, normal, mundane sides of reality, what do we do with people who have a fear? Because within the nihilism of normality, it's based on fear. That's generally what it's based on. It it has links to idealism. And the fear from that, of course, is the fear of settling and the fear of having to live out a normal existence um, that is inclusive of that mundanity, uh, which lives inside the nihilism of normality, that... Um, that you don't want to partake in, that you feel would be 
beneath you and therefore what comes into the nihilism of normality as well is a um a bad relationship with expectation and it's a bad relationship with the child as well specifically like the child archetype if we're talking about the archetypes but just generally the attitude of a child it's it's a it's a bad relationship with the attitude of the child within yourself and because of course the child's the idealist the child is the the one who walks through the forest and looks at all these trees and they're incredible and they're beautiful and they're, all these wonderful ideas shoot off and they go off and they're partaking in looking in the mud and, and looking at all these stones and all these things and they're seeing them in beautiful ways that adults just can't see them and they're they're uh they're almost being idolized they're almost being um idolizing in that way to a certain degree their their uh, their existence is uh it's it's certain there's a certain coloration to it that that isn't involved with an adult existence and so it's this clinging to that idea of the child of everything being wonderful and even just the littlest things being wonderful and um the expectation that comes along with that that you can't place into an adult context if you're going to live within society you can't place this uh everything being wonderful everything being perfect that the child so sees and not only that but that is reinforced by the parents because whenever the child is sad or whenever the child is down the parents help and the parents sort it out and so that perfect existence that the child sees is reinforced and that can't be that can't happen for an adult the adult has to be the one that is the person that takes existence as it is and then obviously in the setting of a family the two adults are the ones that protect that sort of shield the child from society and also from um things outside of society as well until the child is old enough to grow up and and mature in a in a hopefully somewhat safe environment although that's not always the case as we're very well aware because things go wrong in families all the time far too far too common um in many many variety of different ways um they shield the child until they grow up and then they can become that hero figure then they grow up they end up attaining a relationship and then they become the shield for the new family that's kind of how it works um but it's that expectation and and that's tied to the nihilism of normality quite a lot and it's about getting over that now as i mentioned what do we do with people when they fear something in exposure therapy let's say they're scared of snakes just for an example snakes is a very good one because it has ties to primitive ideas and of course there's a lot in mythology about snakes and things like that and humans obviously were around snakes in a primitive setting and even currently there's humans still around snakes in various parts of the world so it's deep seated really so you know you say take someone who's scared of snakes you do it incrementally because that's what the research tells us to do that in exposure therapy it's better to do it incrementally rather than one big hit if you do it in one big hit it's not going to work uh, but if you do it incrementally and slowly build up then you'll get you'll get somewhere you'll get some progression with it so you'll you might say right well we're, we're going to do this exposure therapy and we're going to get you used to snakes so you might first even just go down the route of showing them a few pictures of snakes or reading a little book with them about snakes and give them a bit of information about it or watch a video on youtube with them about snakes and things like that and watch them in their environment and all that sort of stuff just as a very very basic introduction just so you know what sort of level we're at and then you might say well we're going to arrange something and we'll we'll go down to a shop and maybe on the first time i'm not with no pressure you don't have to touch the snakes or anything like that but let's just let's just see if we can go into the 
uh, shop and we'll look at the snakes in the little ga glass cabinets and, and there we go. And then maybe on the third or fourth time, not too many times because the problem with exposure therapy, one of the main problems with it is if you uh you know you have got to be somewhat harsh with someone when you're doing exposure therapy because if you're too lackadaisical then they just they'll just keep going and keep going but n never really get anywhere they won't ever actually do the thing that they need to do fully so you do have to keep it on track and um you know you, you get into this kind of form of uh ego defending as well if you're if you string it out too long and too long, and then someone just ends up ego defending ridiculously anyway. So, you know, you might say third or fourth time we'll we'll do this, and we'll you'll have a snake around your neck or something like that. And then you can get over it a bit more then, and then obviously you need to keep reinforcing that a little bit and keep going with it. But that's the the idea. Um, and so it's just the same with denialism and normality. What do you do to get someone over the fear? You expose them to it. So you expose someone to the nihilism of normality. You put them in a context, um, in a reoccurring setting over a certain time period, and uh, that, that kind of gets into that nihilism of normality and reduces the expectation, the childish expectation, reduces the idealism and sets in the real world in that person. It's simply the same as... Um, growing up into adulthood as well, essentially, there's a lot of this to it, but um, it's it's that kind of, it's this kind of feeling in which we have to do these things to be able to, for someone to be able to overcome it and to get out of this feeling, but it's an interesting feeling that I've observed and that I've been able to understand and come to terms with and to see what it actually is from a psychological viewpoint. Um, and it's funny because it doesn't directly relate to discuss. Sorry, it does relate to discuss sensitivity, um, but it doesn't directly relate to depression because it can be inclusive or an aspect of depression. But it can also be um, as if there's like an unconscious depression present that's not really fully conscious to the individual, but also that they have this nihilism of normality feeling consciously. So they might have some sort of like weird unconscious depression that may arise from complexes, from build up of psychic energy, mental energy in the complexes and certain external stimuli constantly coming in and, you know, the, the psyche is off balance because you've got complexes and you've got the external stimuli that are coming in and crashing against the complexes and there's a lot of turmoil. Think about a rough sea when you're thinking about that, the psyche like imbalance like that. Um, uh, but it's kind of like there's this unconscious depression, but then there's this nihilism or normality consciously. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just about overcoming this and, and moving through uh, the fundamental fear that lives at the bottom of the nihilism of normality. So yeah, I just wanted to talk about my kind of um, idea, that idea that, that uh, is quite interesting, it's quite an interesting one, um, and it, it, it's something that I've kind of been figuring out for a little bit, and, and just observing and, and trying to understand it in some terms, and uh, I think that covers it in some detail, but I think that covers kind of um, what needs to be said with regards to it and its association psychologically um so yeah that that's that's quite all right so anyway i'll leave it there it's been 30 minutes hoping i was hoping this video would only be about 15 minutes but you know it, it is what it is uh we'll leave it there and i will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys bye